my dear sisters and brothers in Christ, we are gathered together in faith and great joy on this last Saturday of May, the Feast of the Visitation of the Blessed Virgin Mary, to ordain our brother, Deacon Chris of our two the Order of the Sacred Priesthood, the Marians of the Back of Conception. His life will be changed forever, as will the lives of the people whom he will serve through his ministry. And I begin my homily by offering great gratitude first to Almighty God for the particular call to the priesthood that he planted in the heart of Deacon Chris, a call that is built upon the universal call to peace, which all of us received in baptism. I offer gratitude to Deacon Chris' parents of first, first helping to give birth to and, and nurturing his call to the priesthood in their family life. I extend this gratitude and thanks also to all the members of his Marian community, especially those who have supported him in formation, whether clergy, religious, or laity. And finally, I offer gratitude to the pastor of St. Anne Parish for hosting this celebration of the Liturgy of Ordination the first time in St. Anne's Church. Today, on this Feast of the Visitation of the Blessed Virgin Mary, we turn to Mary, our Mother, asking that she will place our brother, Deacon Chris, in her mantle in a special way throughout his priestly ministry and intercede for him and for all of us. I want to call our attention to when the angel revealed his message to the Virgin Mary, he gave her a sign to win her trust. He told her, of the motherhood of an old and barren woman to show that God is able to do all that he wills. When she hears this, Mary sets out for the hill country. She does not, she does not disbelieve God's word. She feels no uncertainty over the message or doubt about the sign. She goes in eager purpose, dutifully in conscience, hastening for joy. And as soon as Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb, and she was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth is the first to hear Mary's voice, but John is the first to be aware of grace. She hears with the ears of the body, but he leaps for joy at the meaning of the mystery. She's aware of Mary's presence, but he is aware of the Lord's, a woman aware of a woman's presence, the forerunner aware of the pledge of our salvation. The child leaps in the womb. The mother is filled with the Holy Spirit, but not before her son. Once the son has been filled with the Holy Spirit, he fills his mother with the same spirit. John leaps for joy, and the spirit of Mary rejoices in her turn. When John leaps for joy, Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit, but we know that Mary's spirit rejoices. She does not need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Her son, who is beyond our understanding, is already active in his mother in a way beyond our understanding. Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit after conceiving John, while Mary is filled with the Holy Spirit before conceiving the Lord. Elizabeth says, Blessed are you because you believe. Deacon Chris, I want you to know that you are also blessed because you have heard and believed in God's call and responded and persevered in it. A soul that believes both conceives and brings forth the word of God and acknowledges his works. From this day forward, I encourage you, I urge you, to let Mary's soul be in you and to pro proclaim the greatness of the Lord. Let her spirit be with you to rejoice in the Lord. Christ has only one mother in the flesh, but we all bring forth Christ in faith. Every soul receives the word of God if only it keeps chase, remaining pure and free from sin, is modesty undefiled. The soul that succeeds in this proclaims the greatness of the Lord. Just as Mary's soul magnified the Lord and her spirit rejoiced in God our Savior. 
The Lord is magnified, not because the human voice can add anything to God, but because he is magnified within us. Christ is the image of God, and if the soul does what is right and holy, it magnifies that image of God in whose likeness it was created. And in magnifying the image of God, the soul has a share in its greatness and is exalted. And as we reflect on Mary's visitation to intercede for us and her son Jesus, so that we might imitate her in our gratitude for the tremendous gift of God's love, for the vocation of our brother Deacon Chris, may we all be open to the outpouring of the grace that God so desires to give each one of us. And may we ardently proclaim like his mother, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. In a few moments from now, during the beginning of the promises of the elect that will take place following this homage, these words will be spoken to Deacon Chris. Dear son, before you enter the order of the priesthood, you must declare before the people your intention to undertake this office. You must declare before the people of God your intentions. Why is that reality so integral to this moment in the life of the church? Because at the heart of the priesthood is a ministry focused on the people of God, whom Deacon Chris and all deacons, priests, and bishops have been called to serve. For as meaningful and significant as this moment may be to Deacon Chris personally, the ministry that he will embrace is not his alone. It comes from and is rooted in the life of the Lord Jesus, who came to save us from sin and death and the brokenness of our world who came to bring us new life, as is reflected in our first reading today from the Acts of the Apostles. As St. Peter, the first Pope, states in Acts, he, Jesus, commissioned us to preach to the people and testify that he is the one appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness of sins through his name. Today, in our gospel reading, we hear how the risen Jesus revealed the glory of his resurrection to his disciples gradually over a period of time. And even after the apostles saw the empty tomb and heard the reports of Jesus' appearance to the women, they were still weak in faith and fearful of being arrested by the authorities. When Jesus appeared to them, he offered proof of his resurrection by showing them the wounds of his passion, his pierced hands and side. He claimed, he calmed rather their fears and brought them peace, the peace which reconciles sinners and makes one a friend of God. Jesus did something that only love and trust can do. He commissioned his weak and timid apostles to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. And this sending out of the disciples is parallel to the sending out of Jesus by his Father. Earlier at the Last Supper, Jesus had promised that he would bring peace, a very special kind of peace to his disciples, a peace they could not get anywhere else, and a peace that no one and nothing could take away from them. Now he brings that peace to his, heaven, his highly fearful group. Peace be with you. Jesus shows them the wounds of his hands and side. There can be no doubt. It is the crucified Jesus himself, risen now from the dead. As their fear changes to an unspeakable joy, Jesus again wishes them peace, and then he gives them their mission. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Their mission is the same as his. They are to continue to do what he did. Then he breathes on them, saying, Receive the Holy Spirit. He goes on to say to them, 
to them, those whose sins you forgive are forgiven. This is no mere juridical authority in which people are declared free of guilt. It is much more than that. The disciples are being given the authority to bring people back to God, to reconcile those who have become separated from their God, to renew their unity with the beginning and the end of their lives. They also have the authority to decide which people are not ready for reconciliation. This is ultimately the mission of the church, to bring people to God. It is not primarily to make converts to Christianity or to build up the church of God, but to work with God in building up the kingdom. The kingdom, realize, is the whole world acknowledging the lordship of God, our creator, and people directing their lives to be one with him. This was the mission given by Jesus to his disciples, and the same mission has been given to each one of us. So as soon as a person becomes reconciled with God as Lord and Jesus as Savior, that person in turn accepts the obligation to become, in turn, a reconciler of others. Jesus fulfilled his mission through his perfect love and perfect obedience to the will of his Father. He called his disciples and he calls us to do the same. Just as he gave his disciples the gift of the Holy Spirit, so he breathes on us the same Holy Spirit who equips us with power, with grace and strength. The last apostle to meet the resurrected Lord was the first to go with him to Jerusalem at the Passover time. And while Thomas deeply loved the Lord, he lacked the courage to stand with Jesus in his passion and crucifixion. After Jesus' death, Thomas made the mistake of withdrawing from the apostles. He doubted the women who saw the resurrected Jesus, and he doubted his own apostles, his fellow apostles. And when Thomas finally had the courage to rejoin the other apostles, the Lord Jesus made his presence known to him, and then reassured him that he had indeed overcome death and risen again. When Thomas recognized his master, he believed and exclaimed that Jesus was truly Lord and truly God. Through the gift of faith, we too proclaim that Jesus is our personal Lord and our God. He died and rose, that we too might have new life in him. The Lord offers each of us new life in his Holy Spirit that we may know him personally and walk in his way of life through the power of his resurrection. Beloved brothers and sisters, because our son, Deacon Chris, who is your relative and friend, is now to be advanced to the order of priest, consider carefully the nature of the rank in the church to which he is about to be raised. It is true that God has made his entire holy people a royal priesthood in Christ, Nevertheless, our great high priest, himself, Jesus Christ, chose certain disciples to carry out publicly in his name and on behalf of mankind a priestly office in the church. For Christ was sent by the Father, and he in turn sent the apostles into the world, so that through them and their successors, the bishops, he might continue to exercise his office of teacher, priest, and shepherd. Indeed, priests are established co-workers of the order of bishops with whom they are joined in the priestly office and with whom they are called to, to service of the people of God. After mature deliberation, our brother is now to be ordained to the priesthood in, order, in the order of the presbyterate so as to serve Christ the teacher, priest, and shepherd by whose ministry his body, that is, the church, is built and grows into the people of God, a holy temple. And being configured to Christ the eternal high priest and joined to the priesthood of the bishops, he will be consecrated as a true priest of the New Testament to preach the gospel, to shepherd God's people, 
and to celebrate the sacred liturgy, especially the Lord's sacrifice. Deacon Chris, I remind you today, and of all of us, in the words of Pope St. John Paul II, when he said, it's nice to say that, St. John Paul II, <laughs> he said, the priestly vocation is essentially a call to sanctity in the form that derives from the sacrament of holy orders. Sanctity is intimacy with God. It is the imitation of Christ, poor, chaste, and humble. It is unreserved love for souls and self-giving to their true good. It is love for the church, which is holy and wants us to be holy. Because such is the mission that Christ has entrusted to it, each priest must be holy also in order to help their brothers pursue their vocation to sanctity. And at the heart of the priesthood is the Holy Eucharist, the holy sacrifice of the Mass, where Jesus is made present through the words of consecration at Mass of the bread and wine. It truly becomes the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. And St. John Paul too says that when Jesus said, do this in memory of me, the Eucharist does not simply commemorate a fact, it commemorates him through his daily repetition in persona Christi of the words of the memorial. The priest is invited to develop a spirituality of remembrance. And every time he proclaims these words after consecrating bread and wine, the priest expressed his ever-renewed amazement at the extraordinary miracle worked at your hand. It is a miracle which only the eyes of faith can perceive. It is our relationship to the Eucharist that most certainly challenges us to lead a sacred life. And this must shine forth from our whole way of being, but above all, from the way we celebrate. Let us sit at the school of the saints. And Deacon Christians, St. Paul's letter to the Romans reminds us, may your gift of faith and witness to the mercy and love of God in Christ Jesus strengthen you for the rest of your priesthood. Let your duties absorb you and be conscious of your teaching at all times, depending on the grace of God through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Lord's divine mercy. But above all, may the Blessed Virgin Mary be your model as one of humble service who like her son, Jesus Christ, came to serve and not be served. And so, my brother, at your ordination today, I'm reminded of what the documents of the Council Fathers on Vatican II says about the minister of the priesthood when they state that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the Word, whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, and who was marked with the seal of the fullness of the Holy Spirit, proclaimed to the world the good news of reconciliation. When therefore we speak of the priesthood of Christ, we should have before our eyes a unique, incomparable reality, which includes the prophetic and royal office of the incarnate Word of God. The Church, which he had declared, would be built on Peter, Christ's founder on the Apostles. The Twelve Apostles is exercise their mission and function. And they not only have helpers in their ministry, but they also, in order that that, ministry, that mission be assigned to them, might continue after their death, they pass on to their immediate cooperators as a kind of testament, the duty of perfecting and consolidating the work begun by themselves, charging them to attend to the flock which the Holy Spirit placed them as shepherds of the church. The priestly ministry reaches its fulfillment in the celebration of the Eucharist, as I mentioned, which is the source and center of Christ's unity. Only a priest is able to act in the person of Christ. 
presiding over it and effecting this sacrificial banquet, whereas wherein the people of God are associated with Christ's offering. The ministry of those who life bears the seal of the gift received through the sacrament of orders reminds the church that the gift of God is irrevocable. In the midst of the Christian community, which in spite of its defects, lives by the Spirit, he is a pledge of the salvific presence of Christ. And this special participation in Christ's priesthood does not disappear, even if a priest for ecclesial or personal reason is dispensed or removed from the exercise of his ministry. And finally, every priest will find in his very vocation and ministry the deep motivation for living his entire life in oneness and strength of spirit. Paul, like the rest of those who have been baptized, to become the true image of Christ, like the apostles, shares besides in a special way companionship with Christ and his mission as a supreme pastor. My son, Deacon Chris, now that you will, now that you will always be in my, know that rather that you will always be in my prayers and in the prayers of your parents, your family, relatives, and friends, and your extended married family members. But most importantly, that you will always have the love and prayers and support of your brother Marion's of the of Conception. From now on and for the rest of your life, pray every Mass as if it were your first, your last, or your only Mass. And may you always remember that His mercy endures forever. Now, dear son, you are to be raised to the order of the priesthood. For your part, you will exercise the sacred duty of teaching in the name of Christ the Teacher. Impart to everyone the word of God, which you have received with joy, meditating on the law of the Lord. See that you believe what you read, that you teach what you believe, and that you practice what you teach. In this way, that what you teach be nourishment for the people of God, that the holiness of your life be a delightful fragrance to Christ and faithful, so that by word and example you may build up the house which is God's church. And likewise, you will exercise in Christ the office of sanctifying. For your ministry, the spiritual sacrifice of the faithful will be made perfect, being united to the sacrifice of Christ, which will be offered to your hands in an unbloody way on the altar, in union with the faithful in the celebration of the sacrifice. As celebrant of the mystery of the Lord's death and resurrection, Strive to put to death whatever in your members is sinful, and to walk in the newness of life. Remember when you gather others into the people of God through baptism, and when you forgive sins in the name of Christ and the Church in the sacrament of penance, when you comfort the sick with holy oil and celebrate the sacred rites, when you offer prayers of praise and thanks to God through the hours of the day, not only for the people of God, but for the world. Remember then that you are taken from among men and appointed on their behalf for, the, for these, for the things that pertain to God. Therefore, carry out the ministry of Christ the priest with constant joy and genuine love, attending not to your own concerns, but to those of the risen Jesus Christ. And finally, and dear son, in exercising for your part the office of Christ, head and shepherd, while united with the, the bishop and subject to him, strive to bring the faithful together into one family, so that you may lead them to God the Father through Christ and the Holy Spirit. Keep always before your eyes the example of the good shepherd, who came not to be served, but to serve. <coughs> who came to give and seek and save the Lord's.